Hi, my name is Kate Stewart, and today I'm going to be giving you an introduction to community-based public health. I'm the director of the Office of Community-Based Public Health here in the College of Public Health, and um, I'm also on the faculty in the Department of Health Policy and Management. So um, today, in this uh, lecture, by the end of the section, you'll be able to define and explain the principles of community-based participatory research and uh, community-based public health and also understand why they're important. You'll be able to give at least two definitions of community and then you'll be able to talk about three key factors to consider as an outsider working in a community. And then um, I'm also going to be telling you about some of the structures that are available here in the College of Public Health and at UAMS to support both CBPH, which is the acronym for Community-Based Public Health, and CBPR, the acronym for Community-Based Participatory Research, uh, by faculty and students. This presentation is really focused on community-based public health, community-based practice, and community-based participatory research. And so I'd like for you to think for a minute about what this means. What do we mean when we say something is community-based? So the term community-based, when it's used to describe a research study or a program or some other type of intervention, means that it is grounded in the community as opposed to being brought in and placed there by outsiders. On the other hand, this is also in contrast to programs or studies that are community-driven, which is a term at the other end of the spectrum that implies something that came out of the community and is being controlled and driven by the community. All of these terms are ways of answering the question of where is the impetus for action and where is the locus of control for making key decisions about a project or a policy or an intervention. So we hear a lot about community-based public health practice and participatory research these days, but why is this such an emphasis in public health? Why is it so important that we move away from community-placed to partner more fully with communities in public health practice and research? So this statement is excerpted from the vision statement of the Community-Based Public Health Caucus of the American Public Health Association. And it points out that the reason we need to focus on engaging communities in public health practice and research is because interventions are more effective and sustainable when the community's values, knowledge, expertise, and interest are considered in the process. This statement also uses a broader definition of health and defines community-based public health as an equal partnership where communities and outside agencies and institutions share resources and power, including decisions about how things will be done. The key role of community as a public health value is illustrated in the Public Health Code of Ethics. Five of the 12 principles and six of the 11 key assumptions address issues related to community, such as the nature of community, the interdependence of individuals and groups, the links between communities and the environment, the role of communities in public discourse and collaboration with public health organizations. So why is it important to attend to how community is defined? Outsiders' definitions may not be based on reality in terms of the way people move and interact in the community. How might that play out in a program or research project? If you're making assumptions about who has relationships with who or how, about how decisions are made, you need to determine if your assumptions align with the reality in the community. Let's look at some of the definitions of community. Sociologists typically define a community in terms of group norms, personal relationships, and members' clear roles and expectations of each other. This might include not only having a clear membership, but also common symbol systems, shared values and norms, and emotional bonds, as well as shared needs and commitment to meeting those needs. In public health practice, however, we very often use the term to refer to people from the same geographic area or who have a similar set of characteristics, such as a racial or cultural group, or a group with a certain disease, or who are in a specific age group. Many times these are not communities in the true sense of the community perceiving themselves to be a community with a shared identity, 
but rather what is more like a target population which has been selected as the focus of a public health program or other intervention. Other definitions given by those who are more involved in using participatory approaches include this one in a report from the Agency for Health Care Research and Quality on the evidence for community-based participatory research. It says that community is a social entity with a sense of identity and shared fate. We also find that Minkler and Wallerstein, in quoting Hunter, highlight three aspects of community. The first one being functional spatial units that meet basic needs for sustenance. And then they also talk about units of patterned social interaction and co collective identity. This definition by Bell and Newby in Michelle Issel's book on program evaluation is consistent with the sociological definition, but it also brings into it the concept of geographic or some other form of proximity. She says, community encompasses people, some form of proximity or place that enables interaction, an interaction that leads to shared values or culture. So why is it important to attend to how community is defined? Outsider's definitions may not be based on reality. We already talked about that. In addition, another aspect of defining a community is to think about what its features are. Geography, culture, language, interest, cause, age, occupation, religion, gender, race, ethnicity, disease, disability, gender orientation, gender identity, what social, environmental, infrastructural characteristics define it? What assets? Services, schools, industry, employment, housing, transportation. And who's doing the defining? Often definitions differ between insiders and outsiders. Insiders' definitions may be more focused on shared values and experiences, where ex outsiders may have constructs that don't relate to these experiences at all. Power relations are also very important. Where an individual's salary comes from may influence how they are perceived, since institutions and state agencies often have imbalanced shares of power and partnerships. Think about communities you have worked with as an outsider. Now think of communities you would say you are a member of. What defines these as community? Can people be members of multiple communities? What happens when there is conflict between multiple communities that you are a part of? How do power dynamics play a role in such conflicts? Who represents community? And what difference does this make? What is a gatekeeper? What is their role? What is the role of agencies, of other institutions, of organizations, associations? And how are these other entities defined? Community members may define who represents them based on relationships and involvement in community activities. Local organizations are often chosen because they come directly from the community and understand the true needs of their communities, but their agenda may cloud their priorities such that they may become unwanted gatekeepers. It's important to tailor representation to the needs of your specific project. Grassroots people or activists may be better at helping you to access the perspectives of those who are actually experiencing the issues you're trying to address. But what are some of the issues we encounter when trying to engage grassroots people? These are often people who have been shut out of decision-making in the past. There may be trust issues to overcome as well as discomfort with the traditional approaches we tend to use to share information and make decisions. This sometimes means changing the way we do things and may require us to work with those in the community who are most trusted by those we are trying to engage. Participatory approaches are increasingly being promoted to carry out community-based public health in programs as well as in research. This slide presents nine key principles of community-based participatory research that have been identified by Barbara Israel and her colleagues They've been working as leaders in the movement to engage communities in public health research. So the first principle is that CBPR recognizes community as a unit of identity. This refers to the fact that people define their that how people define their community may or may not coincide with who outsiders may identify as members of a community. 
This principle points out the need to recognize that these differences may exist and to listen to members to determine how they identify their community. CVPR also builds on strengths and resources and relationships within communities and tries to support and expand on the social structures that exist rather than solely focusing on problems, limitations, and areas of concern. This approach also recognizes that there are often resource and power differences that need to be addressed in partnerships through a commitment to collaboration and equitable distribution of resources and shared decision making and sharing of information between all the partners. It also recognizes the knowledge and expertise that all partners bring to the table, making the transfer of knowledge and skills and ca capacity to go both directions. This means that researchers le learn from community members about the history and local understandings held by people in the community and how things are done in their community, while community members learn skills from researchers and benefit from their expertise as well. Another important difference between CBPR and traditional approaches is the explicit intention to move research to action for the benefit of the community as well as more generally. CBPR also has a focus on incorporating the issues of importance to the community involved and attempts to use a sociological model in designing interventions by recognizing the immediate and larger contexts in which individuals live and make decisions. This perspective brings in the social determinants of health and carries with it a concern for addressing disparities in health. This approach involves developing a system for partners to conduct research in a cyclical way using an iterative process from developing relationships to de needs assessment, issue selection, study design and implementation, and dissemination, as well as finding ways to sustain the work that has been done. This principle, when fully implemented, will result in having community members involved in every aspect of the research. This is not how most researchers have traditionally been trained to proceed and can be very challenging to those who like to have control over the process and who believe they know the best way to do things. CBPR also provides information to the community throughout the research process and disseminates research findings to community members in a form that is most accessible to them. This principle also refers to the commitment of researchers to engage community partners as co-authors and presenters of material in publications and at meetings and conferences. And last of all, CBPR involves a long-term commitment and acceptance of the added time that this approach requires of all its partners. More common than the pure practice of these principles is what we call a hybrid between traditional and participatory approaches, where some but not all aspects are implemented. It's not uncommon for a project to begin as a traditional research project, but evolve over time to where community members are more engaged in decisions. There may also be projects that are driven by the community in selecting the issue to work on, but researchers take more control over technical aspects, for instance, in data analysis. <clears throat> Even in strong community academic partnerships that have been going on for a long time, there may be times when partners feel they have to make decisions quickly, for example, to respond to time-limited funding opportunities, precluding the option of getting everyone's input on every aspect. All of these kinds of examples are what we call hybrid approaches that exist along a continuum from traditional to pure CBPR. So how did this approach of participatory research come about? Why is community participation in research now becoming more common and being required by funders for certain projects more than in the past? One of the reasons CBPR has become more common is because traditional approaches to research haven't worked. When communities are not engaged, it can be harder to recruit and retain research participants, and sustainability of research interventions is very rare. Another reason is because communities are demanding more involvement based, in some cases, on having had bad experiences with research in the past, and also because citizens are realizing the importance of their being engaged and having a voice in what and how research is conducted in their communities. 
There's also been an increase in the number of funding sources that are requiring that researchers engage communities using a participatory approach. Likewise, as more data has become available about the disparities in health and healthcare, research has increased on how to address these inequities, and CBPR is most effective in addressing these issues. CBPR is also known um, with other names, including action research, participatory action research, mutual inquiry, feminist participatory research, and collaborative action research. And these are just a few of the examples of some of the other terms that are used to describe this approach. One model for implementing CBPR and CBPH programs is through partners that together make up what we call the three-legged stool. And this includes community-based organizations, which are very often grassroots organizations that serve communities that are suffering disparities in health status. And then also the, uh, another one of the legs of the stool is the academic center where the researchers are located and then local health departments where the public health practitioners work. What defines a community-based program? Baker and Brownson describe three features that define a community-based program. Ecological frameworks, and this basically suggests the importance of acknowledging and addressing individual, interpersonal, community, including social and economic, organizational, governmental, policy, and system level factors. And this multi-level framework, which you've probably learned about in some of your other classes, is used because of the effect that um, we have on individual behavior and directly on health. It comes at, at multiple, there are multiple determinants. The second factor um, is to tailor programs to meet the needs of the people, both individuals and communities, where they are. For individuals, it means identifying where they are with regard to stages of change. And for communities, it means working to find a common vision and set of skills, individual and organizational relationships, trust, and a focus on the common good. Participation varies widely, but in its fullest form, it includes obtaining input from the community throughout the process, from selection of the issues to focus on, to design of the interventions, implementation, and evaluation. And here, communities should particularly include the intended participants of the programs being developed and giving feedback and modifying programs to incorporate suggestions, working together to identify solutions and to sustain efforts. So even though it sounds good to say we have community participation, there are many ways of defining what this means, and the meaning can often be ambiguous. Ideally, this means engaging these who, those people who are experiencing the issue that's being addressed by the project at hand. And, and, and like we've said earlier, doing that in all aspects of the project. But this can be very challenging to achieve. If we're talking about authentic partnerships, as this quote says, we will need not simply involvement, but rather the redistribution of power that deliberately includes traditional have-nots in the sharing of information, setting of priorities and policies, allocation of resources, and distribution of services and benefits. This is challenging to achieve because of the significant disparities in power that usually exist between community members and public health professionals who have specialized knowledge, technical skills, and institutional or governmental support. So as we enter into communities as public health professionals, it's important to focus on the values that allow us to strengthen the communities we work with. Specifically, we need to respect the wisdom of the citizens. We often see people with degrees or with jobs of higher social status or from highly resourced institutions as being the only experts in a partnership, but this is really not the case. Citizens within the community definitely have expertise we as outsiders lack because of their lived experience and knowledge of their community that they bring to the table. At the same time, it's important to have skills and information to offer as a way to help build on assets that already exist within the community. So it's good to consider how you can use your assets to strengthen the community. 
So now we're going to shift to talk about how we have incorporated some of these principles and concepts into the College of Public Health here at UAMS. The College of Public Health was founded with the community-based public health principles at its core. The founding faculty adopted the 1996 statement of the National Policy Task Force on Community-Based Public Health, which we discussed earlier in this presentation. And this emphasizes the importance of community as being at the heart of public health. The founding faculty uh, believed so much in the importance of community-based public health that they adopted several policies to integrate or institutionalize CBPH into the teaching, research, and service efforts of the college. First, the, the nine principles of CBPH were adopted by the College of Public Health Dean's Executive Committee on February 6, 2003. In addition, the Office of Community-Based Public Health was established. And since 2009, several grants have been obtained that support community engagement and CBPH in the College of Public Health, including the Arkansas Prevention Research Center, the Arkansas Center for Health Disparities Research, the UAMS Translational Research Institute, and the Community-Linked Research Infrastructure Project. The nine principles of community-based public health are based on those developed by the Detroit Genesee County CBPH Consortium. These principles are listed here on the next two slides. Community-based projects need to be consistent with the overall objectives of the COPH and of its or other organizational partners. These include an emphasis on the local relevance of public health problems and an examination of the social, economic, and cultural conditions that influence health status and the ways in which these affect lifestyle, behavior, and community decision-making. The purpose of community-based projects is to enhance our understanding of issues affecting the community and to develop, implement, and evaluate as appropriate plans of action that will address those issues in ways that benefit the community. These projects may include any of the traditional missions of a university including teaching, service, and research. Community-based projects need to be designed in ways that enhance the capacity of the community-based partners in the process. And representatives of CBOs, or community-based organizations, public health agencies, healthcare organizations, and educational institutions need to be involved as appropriate in all major phases of the process. That includes defining the problem, developing the information, collection concepts and approaches, gathering the knowledge or data, using the results, interpreting, sharing, and disseminating the results, and developing, implementing, and evaluating plans of action to address the issues identified. These projects are conducted in a way that strengthens collaboration among community-based organizations, public health agencies, healthcare organizations, and educational institutions. These projects produce, interpret, and disseminate the findings to community members in clear language that is respectful to the community and in ways that will be useful for developing plans that will benefit the community. They should be conducted according to the norms of partnership, meaning mutual respect, recognition of the knowledge, expertise, and resource capacities of the participants in the process, and through open communication. Any publications resulting from the work would acknowledge the contribution of participants who will be consulted prior to submission of materials and, as appropriate, will be invited to collaborate as co-authors. In addition, following the rules of confidentiality of certain data, Participants will jointly agree on who has access to the information and where the data will be physically located. And for partner universities, community-based research projects must adhere to the human subjects review process standards and procedures as set forth by the sponsoring organization. So now I'm going to talk about some of the structures that are in place to support community-based public health and community engagement. At, at our institution. As I mentioned earlier, another policy that was adopted with the establishment of the College of Public Health was the development and establishment of the Office of Community-Based Public Health. 
The mission of this office is to establish, uh, to provide a resource for the college in its efforts to promote community-based public health among its faculty, staff, and students, and to support community partnerships. So the objectives are to provide community-based public health and participatory research-related resources and assist with the integration of community-based public health and community-based participatory research into um, teaching, service, and research programs. It also develops grant applications and conducts funded research projects involving uh, participatory approaches and initiates and sustains partnerships with a limited number of community-based organizations to serve as a model um, in these sites for CBPH and participatory research. So in order to communicate that these principles should be applied college-wide, the office is, um, when it was established, uh, was um, administered, is administered out of the dean's office rather than in one of the academic departments to communicate that it really uh, needs to be um, some of the illustrative activities and partnerships of this office include the Community Connector Program, which was implemented by Ms. Naomi Cottoms, who's the Executive Director of the Tri-County Rural Health Network, which is based in Phillips County and serves 15 counties in the Delta, and also the Delta Rural Health Network Program and the AmeriCorps Program that are both run by the Mid-Delta Community Consortium, which is directed by Ms. Anna Huff Davis. So these two organizations are two of our um, longest running partnerships and um, on the next slide you'll um, see the staff of the office. Uh, the founder of the office was Dr. Uh, Thomas Bruce and Kate Stewart is the current director, that's me, and then the other members of the office include Holly Felix, uh, Carla Sparks, Freeman McKendra, uh, Miss Miss Huff Davis, but they are all three community liaisons, and Ginger Morgan and Jake Coffey and Ashley Batchelder. Um, the community liaisons have a role of supporting the college's formal community partners and facilitating projects between these partners and our faculty and students. Next slide, and on this next slide, you can see some of the other community organizations that are formal partners of the college. Many other organizations that partner with us on different types of projects, whether it's research, uh, education, or service, are listed on our website where you can find videos where we've done interviews with representatives of these organizations. We really are very um, fortunate to have so many strong partners. So this next slide just lists some of the resources that we have to offer. Um, because we have so many strong partners, we're happy to work with faculty and students to try to link them with um, partners if they um, are looking for a community partnership for something they're doing. And uh, we're willing to provide consultation if people um, are looking for help with either entering the community or trying to establish a relationship. And um, we also do workshops on community-based participatory research and on the ethics of community research. And we do those, um, we've done that a lot with community partners to help them understand more about the process of research and what's um, involved in doing ethical research. And then we also um, worked with our partners to establish opportunities for students to do preceptorships and um, other kinds of service learning activities. And I want to um, mention in our next slide here a little bit about service learning because this is one of the approaches to education that we are very interested in promoting in our office. And this just goes through some of the... Um, aspects of service learning. It, um, this is from a paper by Serena Cipher, and this just gives an overview and you can see that it lists the features that define service learning, which are very consistent with the principles of CBPR, emphasizing community engagement, reciprocal learning, and focusing on the concerns of the community 
and having an eye toward action and relevance for people in the community that you're working with. But also at the same time, having learning objectives for the student that are met in the process of the project. Next, the next slide just, um, is a framework by uh, Yoder that shows how the different aspects fold into the overall process of service learning. That's some of the components. So in the next slide, I'm just giving some information about our Arkansas Prevention Research Center, which is funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And the mission of the center is to improve the health and well-being of our racial and ethnic minority populations in Arkansas. So the purpose of the PRC is really using a CBPR approach to research and education, and it's primarily focused on chronic disease um, disparities. And the next slide shows the different core units of the PRC. We have, um, in each of these units, we have a, a sort of a unique organizational structure in that we have at every level both an academic and a community co-directors. So, for instance, I'm the academic co-director of the Community Engagement Partnership Unit, and Ms. Henrietta Curtis from Montrose, Arkansas, is our community co-director. And we have the Education and Training Unit, the Communication and Dissemination Unit, and the Evaluation Unit. So um, we also have the research pilot that Dr. Phillips and Ms. Oni Norman from Dumas are running in up two communities in the Delta. We have a community advisory board made up of 11 community members. Some of those members are the co community co-directors as well as other uh, community members from the Delta. And we have community partners in southeast Arkansas. And we've got a map on the next slide that shows the counties that are uh, targeted by the PRC. This MDCC is the Mid-Delta Community Consortium I mentioned earlier that is run by Ms. Anna Huff Davis, which is based in Phillips County but serves 19 counties that are highlighted there. And then the pilot project is targeting those five counties with the P's on there. So this next slide just lists some of the resources that the PRC has to offer. We're a part of a national network of other um, colleges of public health and programs of public health that um, have PRCs. There's a national community committee that is made up of um, representatives of community advisory boards from all of those PRCs. We also have tools uh, within the PRC for community engagement. Um, and again, we have other community partners that are being established through the PRC. We have access to all of those networks that are funded through MDCC, through their HRSA grant. And um, the evaluation unit, which I mentioned earlier, that is run by Dr. Martha Phillips and um, provides technical assistance to community organizations who are looking for help with doing evaluations of their programs. And then we um, have developed and implemented several workshops that are for both community partners and also our community partners are in the process of developing a workshop for researchers on the do's and don'ts of community engagement. The other thing about the PRC that's worth noting is that um, there are special interest project grant opportunities that become available every year and only um, PRCs and I think preventive medicine programs are eligible to apply for those grants so it makes it a much better chance of getting funded than if they were open to everyone in the country. So this uh, PRC does make us eligible to apply for those project grants. So on the next slide, I'm gonna move into talking about the Arkansas Center for Health Disparities Research. This is um, a center that uh, has a mission 
of developing research to improve access to quality prevention and healthcare programs and is really focused on reducing uh, racial and ethnic health disparities. The next slide shows that this is, um, this is a center that is funded by the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. Um, we are now um, in the fourth year of the first five-year center grant, and um, this first grant was focused on chronic disease. There were 18 peer-reviewed pilot research projects that were funded, and um, we had one full research project uh, called Healthy Ways that was, has been run by Dr. Elaine Pruitt. And then the three cores that are mentioned there on the slide, Administrative Research and Education and Training. And also in that first uh, five-year center grant, um, we developed and implemented a four-plus-one degree program with three of the Arkansas uh, historically black colleges and universities so that students could get a, a both a bachelor's and a master's in public health degree in just uh, five years. The next slide shows, though, that um, we had recently uh, applied and received um, funding for or the renewal of the center grant. So we're in the overlapping uh, year right now of the new five-year center grant. And this includes two large Delta-based research projects that are um, just getting up and running, Dr. Holly Felix and Dr. Karen Yuri, and the College of Public Health are running those two projects. This uh, also has the three cores that were in the first center, but it has a new core on community engagement. And I'm gonna say a little bit uh, about that because this is just now getting up and running. And here are the three aims this next slide shows. The first aim is basically we're going to be partnering with Tri-County Rural Health Network to support us in developing strong partnerships in the Midtown and South End area of uh, Little Rock. And this is the 72204 and 72206 zip codes of Little Rock close to UAMS. We'll be developing a strategic plan to increase access to research and service opportunities and um, forming a coalition to implement their strategic plan. So the idea behind using this um, partnering with Tri-County is that they can transfer their knowledge and expertise in working with an academic institution like UAMS to other community organizations. Um, the second aim is to work with institutional partners um, to use community-based data that we generate in the first aim to stimulate and inform efforts to catalyze both community-based disparities research projects and service learning to improve access to services. And then the next slide shows the third aim which is um, in collaboration with the overall evaluation research course to evaluate the activities um, using service utilization data that we're, we'll be um, collecting through our partnership with the Division of General Internal Medicine. And then also looking at process and outcomes data on trust, partnerships, and participation that we'll be collecting um, with our partners through our activities. And this next slide just shows the characteristics of the two zip code areas that are targeted um, by the community engagement component. And one of the main reasons why we have targeted this core on these areas is because um, for the last 10 years, we've been working very um, hard and intensively in the Delta. We've developed a lot of strong partnerships and have... Um, had a lot of successes in those uh, areas, but we really would like to have strong uh, long-term partners in the Little Rock area closer to where we are um, having our students in school and, and research faculty uh, to increase access to those services as well. So we're excited about this. And we'll be, this next slide just shows some of the existing partnerships that we'll be building on in developing this um, core. We're involved at UAMS in the Promised Neighborhood as a partner, and um, we're also working with 
the other colleges and the 12th Street Health and Wellness Center, um, which has a community advisory board and a professional advisory board that we're involved in. And this is an interprofessional student-led center um, right smack dab in the middle of the area that we're targeting. And then we've also been working with the Division of General Internal Medicine in um, the Patient Community Advisory Board. Ms. Carla Sparks and Jimmy Parks, who's one of our DRPH students, um, have been working with Gaban Berryhill in that division and um, other faculty and staff to um, try to obtain community and patient input for improving uh, the quality and access to their services. So um, we also have some partners that we've worked with over the sev last several years um, in a course, a health disparities service learning course that I teach with Dr. Chriselle Nash in our department. And some of those partners are listed here, the Arkansas Community Organizations and some of the neighborhood associations and churches. Um, better Community Developers, and then Village Commons, which we've had uh, long-term relationships with. So we're excited about building on those partnerships. Um, I think I've mentioned in this next slide some of these things will be um, uh, targeting those zip codes, transferring knowledge from our Delta partnerships, and um, identifying community interests and needs and then linking to existing services. So overall, some of the resources that the, I've really focused on talking about the Community Engagement Corps, but there are other things that are done uh, by the Health Disparities uh, Research Center. So these are listing some of those resources. Um, as I mentioned before, the four plus one programs and um, the different projects that are going on with that center. So the next slide I wanted to just mention uh, a, an initiative that we started in July of 2010 in Jefferson County known as the Community Linked Research Infrastructure to Reduce Health Disparities Initiative. The purpose of this project is to develop community infrastructure to support disparities research. And we're trying to basically increase partnerships with minority partners as well as increase participation participation in research by minorities in the Jefferson County area. And um, we have several partners that are listed there. Um, we're working with Tri-County, with the AHEC and Pine Bluff, with 10K Black Men and, and some of the other community partners. We've established a community advisory board and we also have a research collaborative um, we've been doing forums. We've hired community health connectors, which are like community health workers who are helping to connect residents to service and to research opportunities and collecting information from uh, residents of the area to find out what their concerns are, what their health needs are, and what their interests are. So we have a, a resource directory and an electronic health registry that is collecting this information that will facilitate doctors in making connections to services and, and research opportunities, but also in identifying those community concerns for other researchers that might want to partner with, with these groups in this area. And then the last um, structural support I wanted to mention is the Translational Research Institute. So in this slide, we see the steps in translation for those of you who are unfamiliar with the idea. One of the goals of the Translational Research Institute is to change the traditional academic structure into a more collaborative model where academic medical institutions work within the community to move important research findings from the world of academia into the lives of people in the public. Another important part of this approach is to get input from the community about what's important to them and to have that influence the questions that researchers are studying and also how they are doing research in the community. When we think of research, the picture that often comes to mind is like a scientist at a microscope. And that's an important step in the process of research. 
And this is what we uh, know as basic science research. Clinical research is that which is either directly involving a particular person or group of people and uses material from humans, such as their behavior or samples of their tissues that can be linked to a particular living person. So beyond basic science and clinical research are what we call T2 and T3 research. Comparative effectiveness research is designed to inform healthcare decisions by providing evidence on the effectiveness, benefits, and harms of different treatment options. The evidence is generated from research studies that compare drugs, medical devices, tests, surgeries, or ways to deliver health care. Implementation research is taking the results of the T1 and T2 research and learning what methods and information the community needs to have to use those results to improve their daily lives. <clears throat> Implementation research also assesses and explains that is, it not only asks what is happening, but also is it what is expected or desired and what is happening as it is. Why is it happening as it is? Community engagement is an important part of this whole process to be sure that the findings of research are getting translated and applied in everyday practice, but also to allow communities to have input into the questions that researchers are asking and to be involved in how the research is being conducted. So this is some <clears throat> sort of shorthand that people use for the, the idea of translational research as from the bench, so the lab, to the bedside, to the community, and back. So in the next slide... We have the mission of the community engagement component of the Translational Research Institute. Now, this, the TRI is a university-wide infrastructure for research, and um, the community engagement component is one part of that infrastructure. And our mission is to foster collaborative partnerships among three stakeholder groups to promote translational research and apply research findings to the delivery of medical and, and public health services. And this next slide just shows that we're working with both researchers in the academic community, but also the lay community and the practice community, as you see overlapping there. So this last slide just shows that we um, have a number of different kinds of things that we've been doing. Um, we provide consultation to investigators we provide assistance in identifying um, opportunities for collaboration and partnership. We also have some equipment that we've purchased that is commonly used in community-based research so that um, if uh, researchers want to rent out iPads for data collection for a short period of time or if they need um, go, um, um, equipment for setting up a tent if they're doing data collection out in the field or fans if it's hot. There are all kinds of things that we have, so um, check that out. It's uh, described on our on the website. And then we also um, have access to um, provide access to training opportunities. We do mentoring for junior faculty, and um, there is a special uh, pilot funding that. Um, is made available for community-engaged research. So these are some of the activities of the Translational Research Institute. We also have a new uh, community advisory board that is advising the both the community engagement component as well as the overall uh, institute for translational research. So these are the main things I wanted to try to cover today in this lecture. Um, I am. Uh, happy to meet with anyone who wants to <clears throat> ask questions about any of the things that I've talked about. Of course, we teach other classes on community-based public health. This is just sort of a surface-level introduction. But um, uh, we do have a number of preceptorship opportunities um, that are described on our website. Doctor, I mean, um, we have a list of um, opportunities that can be uh, done with our different partners and Carlos Sparks has been really um, spearheading that effort to get more discrete descriptions of projects and if you have questions about that you can talk to her and you can find those on our website and also come and see me and our office is on the second floor in the health policy and management suite and um, uh, 
uh, we'd be happy to talk to you if you want to have more conversation about these issues. And thank you very much.